YouTube sidekick here with another episode of 70 Years of Moving Mud, the History of Iron Bombing podcast. This is episode 10, Series of the Century. If you are new to the podcast and you haven't listened especially to the last couple of episodes, I think you might want to go back and do that because we are going to refer to some of the content that we talked about in episode 8 and episode 9. Uh, and that's because in the last couple of episodes, we have been working our way from the end of the Korean War uh, on our way to the Vietnam War. But in between, we've had to talk about really uh, some real fundament fundamental changes that were going on in the aviation industry and in military aviation in general. So we've talked about the state of aeronautics, specifically what was required not only to break the sound barrier, but to design aircraft that could do that on a regular basis. We've also talked about the massive shift in doctrine that happened after the Korean War, when the United States shifted its posture significantly in terms of how it intended to deal with armed provocation. Essentially, the United States decided after the Korean War that the way that it was going to respond to any significant armed challenge was something called massive retaliation, which effectively meant that the United States was prepared to start an all-out nuclear conflict and expected to win it if it had to. Of fighter aircraft design, then, this meant that the United States Air Force was really only interested in two kinds of aircraft. The first were high-altitude, high-speed interceptors, with which they could intercept enemy bombers, and the second were effectively nuclear-armed deep-strike fighter bombers that would pave the way for the United States' own nuclear bombers that were operated by the Strategic Air Command. So, now that we know the setting in terms of what technology was available and what the Air Force, at least, wanted to use the aircraft for, let's talk about what that generated in terms of aircraft design. Uh, today, in this episode, we're specifically going to talk about United States Air Force aircraft. We will talk about Navy aircraft and maybe even what was going on in some other countries in later episodes. Now, the USAF makes it pretty easy to start talking about these aircraft because it made a decision to start renumbering those aircraft at 100 with the very first supersonic aircraft. So this gives us what is normally referred to as century series of aircraft, that is, ones that start with uh, 100. In some ways, the variety of these aircraft is also a history of the U.S. aircraft industry as it underwent a significant reshuffling in the 1950s and 60s. you got to remember that in those days there were a lot more manufacturers and not really a clear dominant player. Each manufacturer kind of had their own community and their own champions, within the U.S. Department of Defense. They also had their own kind of niche expertise. The advent of the new technology and the new doctrine meant that there was a lot of experimentation going on and quite a bit of sort of jostling for position that you really don't see today where the industry has kind of collapsed down on two or three major players. Now, the first of the significant players in the U.S. aircraft industry, at least in the fighter industry in the 1940s and 50s, was North American Aviation. This was the company that had produced the most famous, and some people believe the most successful fighter of World War II, the P-51 Mustang. And we have actually seen that that was an aircraft that was still in service during the Korean War. North American had also produced other iconic designs, such as the B-25 and the T-6 trainer aircraft, known in the U.S. as the Texan, and two legion of, legions of British Commonwealth pilots as the Harvard. It also, of course, produced the F-86, which was seen as more or less saving the day in Korea and which was widely known to have broken the sound barrier unofficially in a dive at almost the same time as Chuck Yeager and the X-1 were doing it formally for the record books. In short, North American was seen as one of the elite companies in the U.S. fighter industry. By the way, they, as many others of the companies we're going to discuss today, uh, would go on to become a mainstay of the U.S. space industry. North American became the prime contractor for the Apollo program, and later, uh, as Rockwell Aerospace, it was prime for the space shuttle. But in the late 1940s, they were anxious to protect their leading reputation by building on the F-86 to produce the first truly supersonic fighter design. 
which they did. This was the F-100 Super Sabre, actually developed a little bit before the switch to massive retaliation, so it was built more as a traditional air superiority aircraft, capable of doing both offensive and defensive counter-air missions. It certainly met its goals of being supersonic, being the first production aircraft to break the speed of sound in level flight. But that performance did come at the expense of some significant issues. First of all, behavior at low speeds uh, was a bit of an issue. Particularly behavior at or near stalling was problematic, and this was a direct result of the swept wing design that allowed it to be supersonic. You see, typically when a wing stalls, it doesn't do so uniformly along its length. Almost invariably, the stalls start at the wing tips, which is why you often lose aileron control when you're flying an aircraft and the stall approaches. In a straight-wing aircraft, this is actually a good thing, because as the center of lift on each wing moves inward, it actually increases the stability as the stall approaches. But in a swept-wing aircraft, loss of lift at the tips causes the center of lift to move forward, causing the aircraft to want to pitch up, often violently, which, of course, dramatically accelerates the stall, which, at altitude, is not necessarily a huge issue, but on final for landing, however, it's uh, catastrophic and often fatal. This was also uh, an issue because the highly aerodynamic designs, such as the F-100, had much higher stall speeds than ever before. So a pilot flying an F-100 for the first time was faced with landing at, spe landing at speeds of 180 knots, maybe even higher, especially if he was trying to avoid getting close to the stall speed when really bad things could happen. And then, once he got that aircraft on the ground, he was faced with trying to stop a pretty large mass of metal, much larger than earlier air designs had featured, and he had to stop that mass of metal in a reasonable distance. It wasn't actually for the faint at heart. Now, at the other end of the scale, the F-100 experienced some very significant issues with stability in the supersonic and transonic regions. This was due to something called inertial coupling, which is worth a bit of a digression, because it's one of the effects of going supersonic that wasn't really appreciated until a few designs like the F-100 had been tried and had run into this difficulty. You see, one of the effects of going supersonic was actually an overall change in the shape of aircraft. Until the advent of the uh, area rule airplanes, even high-performance aircraft were almost always wider than they were long, meaning that their wingspan was always wider than their fuselage length. But supersonic design started to change that. Wingspans became shorter. Wing sweep meant that they didn't extend out so far from the fuselage. And wings also became thinner, so there was less mass out there on the wings. The net result was that in terms of mass distribution, aircraft uh, began to look less like flat disks with weight distributed evenly, uh, and they began to look more like long rods or even barbells with the weight distributed along a central axis. In physics terms, we would say that the moments of inertia went from being reasonably well balanced to being heavily weighted in one dimension. Now, this is important because when objects are in motion and you try to change the direction that they are moving, they will experience some coupling between the moments of inertia. This basically is the reason why bicycles uh, tip over when you try to turn them. It's also behind the P-factor in warbirds that makes them roll when you pull up. Now, this coupling has always been there, Rolling an aircraft has always made it want to both yaw and pitch, and pitching an aircraft have, has always made it want to both yaw and to some extent roll. But with the old balanced inertia designs, these tendencies could easily be balanced by control forces because none of the moments of inertia was dominant. But with the new supersonic designs, it turned out that there were a lot of flight regimes where this actually wasn't true anymore. At high speeds, a rapid change in one axis could cause enough inertial coupling that it would overcome the available control authority. So, for instance, a rapid roll at high speed would cause the aircraft to literally yaw uncontrollably 
Now, this might cause a sudden uh, departure from controlled flight, meaning, you know, an uncontrolled spin. But at very high speeds, it might also result in the literal disintegration of the aircraft because it was simply not designed to be flying sideways at Mach 1.3. Now, the first condition, departure from controlled flight, was dangerous, no matter when it happened. The second condition was almost invariably fatal, though, because the pilot would literally not have time to eject before the aircraft came apart around him. These were both issues that would bedevil some of the early supersonic designs, not just the F-100. The effect actually killed many pilots, especially test pilots, before it was actually completely well understood. And in fact, it almost killed Chuck Yeager during the X-1 testing. Now, the issues were severe enough in the F-100 that the A model was actually withdrawn from service. The big issue was that the high-speed stability issues occurred exactly in the flight region that would be critical for an air superiority fighter, high-speed, high-altitude dogfighting. As designed, the F-100 was actually just too dangerous to fly in that regime. But by the time that was discovered, there were actually dozens of aircraft in service and more on the way, so some job needed to be found for it. As it happened, this also corresponded to the emergence of the Massive Retaliation Doctrine, and while there were other fighters coming online to address the interceptor role that was envisioned in the Doctrine, there were fewer options available for the fighter-bomber role, so the F-100 was re reintroduced as a fighter-bomber in the D model. Now, as a fighter-bomber, it, it wasn't all that impressive. It didn't have a large payload, didn't have a precision bombing system of any kind, but of the Century Series aircraft, as we will see, it was really the only truly tactical fighter-bomber available when hostilities flared up in Vietnam. So it got the job. And it did yeoman service, not only providing close air support, but also forward air control. And in fact, it ended up being one of the more successful of the Century Series, at least in terms of number produced and also longevity. It wasn't retired until 1979. But it must be said that it lived almost all of its life doing jobs it was never designed to do. Now, the second of the Century series is the F-101 Voodoo made by McDonnell Aerospace. Now, McDonnell was a relatively new entrant to the field, having spent World War II building aircraft that were designed by other people. In fact, McDonnell didn't even start designing aircraft until pretty late in the Second World War, and it had only ever designed jet aircraft. Most of the aircraft that it had designed had been for the Navy. Uh, most famously, of course, it would go on to design the F-4, but that design was based on three models that basically led up to it. The F-H, the F-2H Banshee, and the F-3H Demon. Through these designs, the company had kind of converged on a standard layout, with twin engines mounted in the middle of the aircraft, with inlets just forward of the wing, and the exhaust under the tail. Now, McDonnell was actually the first to pioneer this design, although it has become very much a standard layout. McDonnell would also, by the way, go on to become a mainstay of the U.S. space program, being the prime contractor for the Mercury and Gemini spacecraft. But in 1950, it was worried about establishing a relationship with the United States Air Force by developing a new fighter design. Now, this fighter design was initiated at about the time of the beginning of the Korean War, so it wasn't entirely aligned with the massive retaliation doctrine that became the current doctrine in 1953. So the F-101 was originally designed as an escort fighter. But by the time it flew, this role had kind of become obsolete, mainly because bombers were flying so fast and so far that it really wasn't possible to escort them. So, as with the F-100, the F-101 found a new life with a new variant, this time as a two-seat interceptor, taking advantage of new air-to-air -air radar capabilities and adding another crew member to operate the radar. In this role as an interceptor, the F-101 will actually stay in service until 1982 with the Royal Canadian Air Force, although, to be fair, it never really spent a lot of time in USAF livery. It also, by the way, uh, never dropped a bomb on anybody, so we won't be talking about the F-101 very much in the history of iron bombing. <laughs> 
The next set of aircraft that we're going to talk about are the Convair F-102 Delta Dagger and F-106 Delta Dart, and we're really going to talk about them together because the F-106 is really a later variant of the F-102, although it did feature some fairly significant design changes. Now, Convair is not a name that comes immediately to mind when you're thinking about aircraft, at least not anymore. But actually, uh, as the combination of consolidated and Volte aircraft, it had a fairly long and successful history. Of course, its most famous design was the B-24, which established the company's reputation for building high-altitude, high-performance aircraft, a reputation that was cemented when it won the contract to build the successor to the B-29, which became the B-36 Peacemaker, which was actually one of the largest, in terms of dollars as well as size of aircraft, United States Air Force procurement programs in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And in fact, Convair was arguably the largest contractor in terms of dollar value as a supplier to the United States Air Force at the time. So, in fact, if you have not heard of Convair, it's probably because it was actually bought by General Dynamics in 1954 and subsequently went on to contribute to aircraft like the F-111 and the F-16, but under the corporate label of General Dynamics. Interestingly, it too would go on to become a mainstay of the United States space industry under the Atlas label, in which form it produced a series of booster rockets, including the ones that launched the Mercury spacecraft and the Gemini program's Atlas Agena target vehicles. Having worked on the high-level strategic bombing problem from the bomber side gave Convair some interesting insights into the area of operating at high speed and high altitude, and their response was to look at an innovative design based on the Delta Wing. This became the basis for both the F-102 and the F-106. It also became the basis for the B-58 Hustler strategic bomber, which was meant to be a successor or replacement for the B-36. The Delta Wing design was chosen because it had certain real advantages for high-speed, meaning supersonic, flight. For one thing, the need for a separate horizontal stabilizer or stabilator went away. And as we talked in the episode about breaking the sound barrier, this had some significant advantage in terms of managing the shock waves created by going supersonic. For another reason, it solved the problem of pitch-up during stalls, because while it retained a highly swept wing-leading edge, it didn't have the same problem that when the tips stalled, the center of lift would move forward. Finally, since the wing was pretty large, it also helped reduce the chances of inertial coupling, so effectively the Delta Wing design answered a lot of the questions that were being raised by the F-100. But... As with most of these early supersonic aircraft designs, the Delta Wing did have some significant drawbacks as well, and the chief among these was really low-speed, low-altitude handling. Basically, the Delta Wing produced a, an enormous amount of drag in a turn, which basically limited the ability of the aircraft uh, to dogfight to effectively nil. It also meant that the performance overall decreased dramatically, at lower altitudes. Now, future Delta Wing designs would discover ways of mitigating these problems so that many advanced fighters have been and continue to be Delta Wing designs, but the F-102 and the F-106 were pretty much designed to be good at going fast, in a straight line, and climbing quickly, and at this they certainly excelled. Because of these qualities, and also the weapons that they carried, uh, which were early air-to-air -air missiles, and even, believe it or not, unguided air-to-air -air rockets, and no gun, they were effectively useless for any other job than the one they were designed for, which was shooting down large Soviet bombers, which was a job that either went away or never materialized at all, depending on how you look at it. There is one recorded instance of an F-102 being involved in air-to-air -air combat in Vietnam, when a pair of F-102s had been pressed into service as an escort for an electronic warfare aircraft they were jumped by a pair of MiG-21s, and the results were uh, pretty abysmal. One of the 102s was shot down, and the MiGs got away without any damage suffered. Of the Century fighters, the F-102 and the F-106, 
were really the first to disappear, and this is really mostly because they were never able to find another role that they could fill. So once the interceptor role in Air Defense Command went away, so did they. Now the next of the Century series, the F-104 Starfighter, is kind of the flip side of the F-102-106 story. The F-104 was designed as a pure interceptor, but through a little redesign and some creative marketing, went on to have a long and storied career doing things other than the job it was designed to do. The F-104 was developed by Lockheed. Now, at the time, Lockheed was not the powerhouse of the industry that we have come to know today. In terms of its own designs, it was really no slouch. It was principally known for the P-38 during World War II, of which over 9,000 were produced, which certainly didn't make it a small part of the industry. But Lockheed was really not seen as a dominant player, and certainly not in the fighter industry, in the way, for instance, that North American and Republic were. At the time, in fact, Lockheed was much more associated with large multi-engined aircraft like the C-130. Now, that would change in coming decades, but in 1954, the F-104 was actually only Lockheed's second fighter design. As I said, the F-104 was again designed to fill the high-altitude interceptor role, but in keeping to some extent with Lockheed's reputation for trying innovative designs, it took the exact opposite approach uh, as Convair had. Where the F-102 and 106 went with large, highly swept delta wings to operate in the supersonic regime, the F-104 went with the absolute minimum wing area and wing cross-section. It didn't use a swept wing per se, but it used a wing that was tapered symmetrically at both the leading and the trailing edges, thus getting rid of the pitch-up problem at stall. And it put the horizontal stabilizer high up on the tail to get rid of the issue of the shockwave. And the landing gear didn't retract into the wings, though, and the wings were in fact so thin that ground crews had to install shields on the leading edges when working around the aircraft to avoid cutting themselves. The F-104 was basically designed to be as light and simple as possible. Designers then stuck the absolutely largest engine they could find in it, and essentially designed a fuselage that could contain that engine. The F-104 really was a rocket ship. It was really just a huge jet engine with the absolute bare minimum of other stuff built around it to allow it to be flown. It's actually no wonder that old starfighters have been very popular with groups who've attempted to break ground speed records. They basically just pull the wings off, put on a new undercarriage, and voila, a big jet engine on wheels. Once again, the F-104 was not really designed for any other role than intercepting enemy bombers. It was not designed to be maneuverable, and it was not really designed to operate at low altitude. Unlike the F-102, it actually was, though, very successful in the air-to-air -air role. It saw some limited action in Vietnam, where they principally operated as barrier cap, protecting EW aircraft from interference from the Vietnamese MiGs. Overall, though, even as the Vietnam War was beginning, the United States Air Force was moving away from its reliance on high-level interceptors to protect the North American continent and more towards a general air superiority design that could engage in both offensive and defensive counter-air missions. This trend only accelerated towards the end of the Vietnam War, so like the F-102 and the F-106, the role that the F-104 was designed for more or less went away. But unlike the dart and the dagger, though, the F-104 found a new lease on life as an export fighter. This is a concept that I think we may have to deal with in its own episode eventually, because it certainly crosses over with the discussion of what was going on in the uh, rest of the West during the 1950s and 60s in terms of aircraft design. But to summarize the situation, as the U.S. aircraft designs became increasingly larger and heavier and more complex, uh, the U.S.'s NATO allies increasingly found that they just couldn't afford to buy those aircraft. And this was a concern for the United States Air Force in terms of interoperability with these allies. <laughs> it was a grave concern for the U.S. aircraft industry that depended on those foreign contracts to close their business cases, especially for aircraft that the United States Air Force was not planning to buy in quantity. <laughs> 
The export fighter concept was effectively invented to address this issue. The idea was that if there were U.S. aircraft designs that were lighter and less complex and critically cheaper, these would be good candidates to offer to allies who didn't want to invest in F-4s or F-111s or later F-15s and F-14s. And so, through a combination of good fortune and, I have to believe, truly inspired marketing, or rather business development as it's called in the business, and also which did involve some um, questionable financial deals, um, let's just say that Lockheed managed to turn a high-level interceptor into the main NATO multi-role fighter of a generation. And so the F-104, like the F-100, went on to have a long history, and it did spend a lot of time dropping air-to-ground munitions, though most of it not in USAF livery. So we will have to cover the F-104 as an iron bomber eventually, but those days are still a bit in the future, and we'll have to put that discussion off for now. Which brings us to the only one of the Century Series fighters that was actually designed from the ground up to be a fighter bomber, and really an iron bomber to boot. I speak, of course, of the Republic F-105 Thunder Chief, known pretty much universally by its pilots as the Thud. Now, Republic Aerospace was, of course, famous for the P-47, known as the Jug, which was the other candidate I was thinking of as uh, potentially being the most successful U.S. fighter of World War II. And we've already discussed it uh, in this podcast series because it really was one of the very first iron bombers. Now, unlike North American, which had been going from success to success with the P-51, the F-86, the F-100, Republic had struggled in the late 1940s and early 1950s. It had designed the F-84 family of fighters, known as the Thunder Jet, and then the Thunder Streak, and then the Thunder Flash, uh, over the course of a series of variants. It had been bought in some numbers, but it hadn't really been all that impressive. Uh, which you can tell, because A, you probably haven't heard of any of those aircraft, and B, they didn't end up with a catchy one-syllable name like Jug, or Thud, or later Hog. So, Republic was very much looking back to get in the game, which it definitely did with the F-105. As well as being the only fighter bomber in the group, it could be argued that he's the one Century Series fighter that really ended up doing the job that it was designed to do, although not in the environment that it was expected to do it. In fact, it's probably arguable that the F-105 ended up doing more of its job in combat maybe than any other U.S. aircraft ever has. I'm pretty sure if you added up uh, the amount of ordnance that the F-105s dropped during Vietnam, it may add up to more than any other single variant of U.S. aircraft, but I'm not sure about that. But it didn't end up doing it under the conditions that were expected when it was designed, and that had some serious ramifications. You see, the F-105 was designed to be a deep strike or penetration bomber. It was intended to precede the wave of high-altitude SAC bombers and to pave the way for them by degrading, disabling, or dismantling air defenses in their way. Now, remember at the time, again, this is the mid-1950s, remember at that time, air defense pretty much meant fighter interceptors based at fixed locations that were controlled based on ground-based radar. So the F-105's main targets were expected, therefore, to be air bases, radar installations, and ground-based control nodes. And remember, given the radar technology of the day, none of these uh, were particularly mobile targets, and it would even be stretching them to call point targets. They were pretty large installations, uh, by and large. Which really did not matter, since the F-105s were expected to attack them with nuclear weapons. Small nuclear weapons, but nukes nonetheless... In short, precision bombing was not really what the F-105 was designed for. The F-105s were equipped with only the most basic air-to-ground sighting system, and the one concession to their mission being the low-altitude bombing system, or LABS. But, in actual fact, LABS was not much more than a timer with an auto-release mechanism that was designed to allow a low-flying fighter bomber to drop a nuclear bomb, uh, safely. The pilot would approach at treetop level, pull up according to his own reading of cues on the ground in terms of where he was, 
and he would pull up into a near vertical climb and start the lab's timer. The timer would count down and automatically release the bombs at the appropriate time. The release timing was based on an expected and fixed pull-up profile that started at the right distance from the target and involved pulling up using specific parameters for speed, g-load, and climb angle. There really wasn't a whole lot of computation going on. It was up to the pilot to hit the pre-calculated parameters of his approach in order for the system to deliver the weapon accurately. Let's face it, though, since it was designed to deliver kiloton-class nuclear warheads, eh, the accuracy requirements weren't all that strict. All of which is to say that being a deep-strike fighter bomber did not require a sophisticated bombing system, and so the F-105 didn't have one. What was required, though, in a nutshell, was speed. Speed and payload. And more to the point, speed and payload at low level. Which actually matters, because going fast at ground level is a little bit different than going fast at 20,000 feet. In terms of aerodynamics, it's actually more demanding, because the air is much denser at sea level. On the other hand, the engine at a sea level fighter is going to be operating in an environment where it is getting a nice, dense, oxygen-rich air, which means that in some ways it's easier to develop maximum thrust. So aircraft designers did have to think about where their aircraft were going to operate, and for all of these high-level interceptors, it not only affected the way the aerodynamics worked, but it also affected the way air was fed to the engines. Now, not so with the thud, because it wasn't designed to fly high. It was designed to fly low and fast, and it was optimized for that environment, which those other fighters were not. In fact, even until it was retired in the late 1960, there were really very few jets that could catch an F-105 with a full head of steam at 50 feet off the deck. So, when the Vietnam War arrived in the United States Air Force was called to deliver strikes deep inside enemy territory, the F-105 was the natural choice to become the main focus of their effort. Unfortunately, as we'll talk about in future episodes, the air defense environment in North Vietnam turned out to be quite different and quite a bit more challenging in 1967 than the one the THUD had been designed to operate against in East Germany in 1955. Challenging enough, in fact, that the F-105s suffered unsustainable loss rates in their attempt to operate in it, and the THUD was actually withdrawn from frontline service in 1969, being replaced by the F-4 and the F-111. But that is actually definitely a story for another day. For now, though, I'd leave you with this thought on the Century Series fighters. They represent a time when aircraft designers were really experimenting with a new regime of flight where there were lots of different potential, and they were also experimenting with new power plants that were delivering literally unheard of levels of power. All of these aircraft were impressive feats of engineering, and they are all, in one way or another, icons. But here's the really interesting thing to remember. Not one of them ended up fighting the war that they were expected to fight. And that'll be worth remembering as we start talking about the war in Vietnam. But that's still a few episodes off, though. Uh, next time on 70 Years of Moving Mud, we'll take a look at what aircraft the U.S. Navy was having designed and built as it entered the brave new world of supersonic flight. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you again soon.